Okay, in the last talk, uh, I argued that slavery was a national wrong involving the North at every point uh, for over 200 years uh, as the South, involving it at every point. And therefore, that the morally right thing to have done would be a national plan of compensated emancipation and gradual integration of the freedmen into American society. That would certainly be, I think, our standard. Uh, and the question was, what progress did the antebellum North make toward that goal? And what I tried to show is, despite all the anti-slavery talk, it made no effort whatsoever, none, to um, put forth a national plan of compensated emancipation and integration. No effort whatsoever. It's a pretty strong claim. Uh, the abolitionists talked about a national emancipation, but they demanded immediate and uncompensated emancipation, which uh, was a non-starter. That's all they had. But what the North did do is it worked very hard for four policies to keep the blacks, to, to free themselves from the presence of black people. The North was virtually all white in 1860, and they had succeeded. So that, they made no contribution. Now the question here is, what contribution did the South make to uh, emancipation? The South, however, did put forth a national plan of emancipation. Southerners from Jefferson, uh, Madison to Jefferson Davis argued that slavery should be allowed in the Western territories precisely because that would better facilitate gradual emancipation and integration. I shall call this the diffusion thesis, diffuse the African population across the continent. It was part of a, law, a southern emancipation tradition that goes back to the very founding. Where are my glasses? Excuse me. No, those are somewhere. Here, here they, I got it. Sorry. Excuse me, uh, videographers. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it was part of a southern emancipation tradition that goes back to the founding. Now notice this, historian Alice Dana Adams observes that from 1808 to 1830, the South was undutably, quote, undutably the leader and the larger force in the anti-slavery movement, end quote. As of 1830, for example, there were more anti-slavery societies in the South than in the North. 106 in the South, only 24 in the North. The Southern societies had 5,150 members, the Northern societies 1,475. Nor is that all. Up to the 1830s, for 130 years, nearly all pro-slavery literature was written by northerners, mainly clergymen. All, nearly all. The first pamphlet was published in 1701. And that was about half of all antebellum literature on pro-slavery positions. The vitality of the South's emancipation tradition appears in a special session um, of the Virginia legislature uh, in 1831-32. Keep those dates in mind. The legislature passed a resolution to explore emancipation. Every argument for and against slavery was presented in a civil manner. The debate lasted for weeks and was made public on a daily basis um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the people. Eventually, an abolition bill was voted down by a close majority, and the topic was tabled for a later day as difficulties arose in just how to end the institution and who was to pay for it. Jefferson's grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, considered the public debate itself a victory for the emancipation cause. This thing was made open in the air, debated by the public, and that was a, 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 a victory. But two years prior to the debate, William Lloyd Garrison founded the abolitionist movement in New England. 
a small but highly vocal and aggressive movement that put forth a non-negotiable demand for immediate and uncompensated emancipation, and along with it vilified Southerners and the Constitution without mercy. And I stress the latter. They were big on vilification. Madison bitterly complained that this fanatical movement had derailed progress the Southern emancipation tradition had made in Virginia up to that point. How different American history would have been had Garrison and his New England abolitionists uh, acknowledged the national wrong of slavery and offered to partner with the Virginians in a national plan of compensated emancipation and integration. And, 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 and both were occurring at the same time, the Virginia debate and the abolitionist uh, appearance. But to Garrison, this was unthinkable. He even refused to support the famous British bill emancipating slaves in the Caribbean in 1834, just two years after the Virginia debate. Why did he reject it? Because it contained compensation and a five-year apprenticeship period. You wouldn't accept any, anything reasonable. Emancipation with integration was an uphill task because most Americans did not think the African population was part of the polity. They were kind of like guest workers who were not really citizens, but in this case, they weren't voluntarily guests, they were forced over, but still they had that status. Jefferson and Madison noticed, however, this preconception was less likely to occur where the African population was a small, non-threatening uh, minority in a white population. In the South, however, blacks were reproducing at, the same, at about the same rate as whites. They were so well cared for. In 1790, whites were a majority in Virginia. By 1810, they were a minority. In Madison's County alone, blacks were a 60% majority. This dangerous racial imbalance in the South, like slavery itself, was an accumulated national wrong, left unattended because both North and South were too busy making money on slave-produced staples. So, as most Congresses and Parliaments do, they kick the can down the road. To correct this, Jefferson and Madison proposed the diffusion plan. That owners should be free to take their slaves into the vast unpopulated territories where they could be freed in small numbers, which would facilitate emancipation and more importantly, integration. No point in emancipating people if they're not gonna be, uh, if you're not gonna be associated with them. Nor would this policy lead to a vast Western slave empire, which some said, because as Charles Ramsdale has shown, the geography of the territories did not lend itself to large-scale plantation agriculture. But it did lend itself to migration of small slaveholding families. Now, it's very important to understand that nearly half of all slave owners had only one to five slaves, nearly half. And a third had only one or two. <coughs> slaves at this small scale worked with their owners in the field, lived in the same house or in the same yard, ate the same food and attended church with them. The social intimacy of small scale uh, uh, slaveholding families moving west would make emancipation and integration more likely. And once emancipated, the freedman would not be an isolated alien in a white man's country because he would have the recommendation and protection of his former slaveholding family, which had personal relations with him. But large uh, phil philanthropic planters who wanted to free their slaves would also benefit. They could escape the state laws that made emancipation practically impossible. One of these was Virginia planter John Randolph. 
who died in 1833, a year after the Virginia debate on slavery. He left funds in his will to free and build homes and farms for his 300, over 300 slaves in the Ohio, free state of Ohio. Likewise, Madison proposed that the central government provide funds to free slaves at $400 each and set aside millions of acres in the territories, the uninhabited territories, for settlement of freed blacks. Such proposals fell on deaf ears because the North and West were nearly all white and Northerners wanted to keep it that way. Now, what do I mean they were nearly all white? Consider the, the following statistics. Blacks in New England had been reduced to 0.8%. That's less than 1%. And many of those were in Connecticut. And northern, uh, blacks in the Midwest, in the Mid-Atlantic North, were 1.8%. In the Midwest and West, about a little over 1%. Whereas blacks in the Upper South, uh, this is 1860, were uh, over 20 percent, and in the up uh, and in the deep south, over 40 percent. We're talking about a black nation in those places. Even now, historians frown on diffusion on the diffusion thesis. But what was the alternative? Refusal to recognize the explosive racial imbalance in the South as a national problem. Not a southern problem, but a national problem, leaves us with, with only the North's Dar Darwinian solution, namely the extinction thesis discussed in the previous talk. Remember that? Yes. Jefferson and Madison understood that if the North continued to deny that slavery and the racial imbalance in the South was a national problem, then the Union is effectively dissolved. And they hoped that wouldn't happen. That's what, what Jefferson meant by a fire bell in the night. Most believed that states could lawfully secede from the Union, and when asked for a ruling about South Carolina seceding, President James Buchanan and his Attorney General ruled that the central government had no constitutional authority to use military force to prevent secession of an American state if ratified by the sovereign people of that state. So that's the ruling that came from the executive. Therefore, the South had as much right to secede from the Union as the Constitution stood in 1861, as Britain had to secede from the European Union in 2016. Or that 15 states had to secede from the Soviet Union in 1991. Indeed, the abolitionists themselves initially urged that the North secede from the South as the best way to put slavery on the road to extinction. So this secession alternative was a, a living part of the American Constitution, but it's been pretty much suppressed in mainline historians. Now, the stock response to this thought experiment by mainline historians is that even if there were such a right, the South has such a morbid love of bondage that without the brute hand of war, whatever its uh, motivation, slavery in some form might exist today. So the war was really a good thing, though it was not, was not intended to free slaves. But is that true? And what follows, I want to explore five dispositions of Southern culture, character, and practice that show the South had the moral resources needed to abolish slavery in a reasonable time frame without Northern support. I shall call these intimations of gradual emancipation. I mean, they're not pro proclamations of gradual emancipation, but they're intimations that make it highly likely over time. The first of these, as strange as it might seem, is racial integration. The North did not favor a national emancipation plan because they did not want to live with blacks. They wanted to remove them from their presence. But racial integration was not a problem for Southerners. It couldn't be. 
For two centuries, Southerners had lived in intimate social relations of reciprocity with blacks on a daily basis. Blacks attended church with their masters and public transportation was not segregated as it was in Boston. White children were nursed by black women. Um, to be sure, blacks, slave and free, were subordinate to uh, whites, but women were subordinate to men too. Women had no political rights. They could not sit on juries, and they couldn't do that in Massachusetts as late as 1960. And uh, women lacked the full range of civil rights enjoyed by men. But were not women integrated <laughs> into society? Do you have to be equal to be integrated? Um, but women, uh, sorry, social, social racial integration, though limited, I don't want to romanticize it, though limited, was a solid social foundation on which more extensive forms of integration and equality could be and were grafted over time, as we shall see. Nothing like that existed in the North. The second intimation, that's the first, the second intimation of emancipation was that Southerners had developed a higher opinion than Northerners of the capacity of blacks for achievement. This was demonstrated in a study, which I highly recommend, called Time on the Cross, the Cross, by Robert Fogel, a Nobel laureate in economics, and Stanley Ingerman, an authority on slave economies. Historians, they argue, have greatly exaggerated the cruelty of slavery and the capacity of slaves for achievement. The first thing to consider is, is how well slaves were cared for in the antebellum South, and it was unusual. In 1800, for example, there were a little over a million slaves in the United States. Had they suffered the mortality rate of British slavery in the Caribbean, there would have been only 186,000. Not a million. That was the mortality rate. The Southern slave diet exceeded the daily amount of the chief nutrients recommended in the U.S. in 1964. They didn't have much junk food. The late antebellum cabin contained more sleeping space per person than was available to most workers in New York City in 1880s. And slaves had a longer lifespan than factory workers in the U.S. and Brit Europe. The authors, argue, the authors argue that judged by equal output for equal input, southern free farms were 9% more productive than northern farms, but plantations were astonishingly 40% more productive. And with modern methods, they were 53% more productive. Planters achieved this spectacular level of efficiency not by driving listless slaves with the crack of the lash, but by educating them in a variety of professions requiring expertise, which included husbandry, land surveying, carpentry, architecture, machine building and repair, bookkeeping, and plantation management. They wanted responsible workers who identified uh, their fortunes with the plantation and had an incentive for achievement. Planters achieved this not by brute force, but with the, what the authors call optimal force. Just enough force to do the job, coupled with pecuniary rewards in the form of cash, bonuses, prizes, land on which to grow crops for profit, greater liberty, and greater respect. So the planters had to give something back to get the achievement motivation. And that's how they, why they were so uh, efficient. It cost planters $48 a year per slave for food, housing, and medical care. One planter gave each family a year-end bonus of $15 to $20, when the national per capita white income was 
An Alabama field hand earned $309 in a single year and had loans owned to him of $2,400, an amount equal to the annual per capita income of 24 white workers. Slaves with expertise were hired out by their masters. There were 31% of slaves in urban areas in, in 1860, 31%. In Richmond, they were 50%. Now these artisans were allowed to establish their own base of operation, advertise their services, travel to negotiate with customers, and manage their own finances. The main difference between them and free artisans is that the latter had to pay the master a certain amount of the profits. But he also enjoyed cradle-to-grave welfare as a member of the plantation household. So he had a social security backup. A tobacco factory in Virginia paid slave workers less than $60 a year and the highly skilled more than 300. One skilled artisan commanded $500 a year, five times the per capita income of white workers. Visiting Yankees were shocked by these high wages. Olmsted, for example. One planter turned his whole plantation over to the management of his slaves. Why hire a white worker to manage things when you go on to vacation to Europe? Let your slaves manage it. He supplied food and tools and received a certain percentage of the income. The slaves were responsible for planning the operations, planting, harvesting, and marketing the output. They paid the bills and divided the profits according to rules agreed upon. Only 30% of plantations with 100 or more slaves had white managers, only 30%. Smaller plantations, the authors argue, uh, had less. A ben Montgomery, a slave who managed Jefferson Davis's brother's plantation, was accomplished in many fields. He had his own store and invented an ingenious propeller for steamships on the Mississippi. But he couldn't receive a federal patent because he was a slave and not a citizen. And Davis tried to vouch for him and that didn't work either. Later as president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis supported and signed a bill allowing slaves to receive patents in their own name. If certified by the owner, I mean, it had to be certified. Fogel and Ingerman estimate that around 25% of slaves were educated by planters in various forms of expertise, which gave them a higher degree of status, liberty, and respect. Northern employers, however, had no incentive to divest time and money in educating free blacks allowed in the North. And remember, remember how small that population was in the North? So blacks in the North generally did the menial jobs, which reinforced Northern prejudices about their capacity. Remember, Theodore Parker believed that if blacks stayed in New England for 20 generations, they wouldn't improve. Remember that? That shows you how, how, how low opinion they had of black achievement. But the planters knew otherwise, because they were actually dealing with them every day, and they could see that uh, they didn't need to hire white people. They could, they could use their own slaves to do bookkeeping and all the rest of it if they wanted to. Now, the authors also warn against too sharp a distinction between liberty and slavery. Americans think ideologically, just in terms of abstractions. They say, no, we've got to stop that. He says, in the South, there was what he co they call quasi-slavery, which shaded into considerable liberty. And also in the North, there was quasi-freedom, which shaded into something almost like slavery. Quasi-slavery, quasi-freedom. That's a very wise distinction, even today. The son of Ben Montgomery, the industrial slave who invented the propeller, uh, said, quote, we just barely had an idea what slave life was like, <laughs> quote. Davis would take slaves hunting with guns and, and all the rest of it. Now, this was not true everywhere, of course. There was brutality uh, in slavery and, and all the rest of it. But these were realities. What, what Ben Montgomery's son mentions, they were realities. 
and there were lesser versions of it uh, throughout the South. There were more free blacks in the South than in the North, 260,000 of them. They owned property worth $25 million. In some states, around 40% of free blacks owned slaves. In other states, 20%. John Carruthers, a free black, owned 163 slaves and employed three white overseers to manage his plantations. Some 42% of free blacks in Charleston owned slaves. 42% of free blacks. And 64% of these were women. God. Maria Weston of Charleston owned slaves worth $40,000 at a time when a white man's wages averaged $100 a year. William Ellison was born a slave in 1790 South Carolina, near where you live. Yeah. About 15 miles from there. Yeah. He was born eight years after Calhoun was born. Let's keep that in mind. Ellison bought his freedom, ran a cotton gin production, and became a wealthy planter. He married and bought an ex-governor's mansion and eventually owned 63 slaves. He supported the Confederacy financially, and his grandson, John Wilson Buckner, joined the 1st South Carolina Artillery and was wounded July 12, 1863, fighting the attack on Fort Wagner by the black 54th Massachusetts of, glory, of the film Glory. Just as pecuniary incentives to achievement and force both were equal parts of the plantation system, force and pecuniary rewards. So were friendships and force. Friendships and force. The authors write, quote, there is too much evidence of deep personal attachments between owners and their bondsmen to deny this was a facet of the slave system. An African-American historian, James Weldon Johnson, writing in 1912, said, and this is even during segregation, said, quote, Northern white people love the Negro in a sort of abstract way as a, as a, as a race with, through a sense of justice. They, they need rights. Yet generally speaking, they have no particular liking for individuals of the race, end quote. This affectionate relation between Southern whites and blacks, he says, has not been overdrawn even in fiction, end quote. That's a black commentator. In the 1850s, a popular form of literature appeared throughout the South about how a child discovered death with the passing away of a beloved slave and was consoled by the teaching that they would be reunited in heaven. This genre of literature taught the child the Christian message of heaven and to love the black people in his society. No such literature, as far as I know, existed in the North, nor would there be any interest in it. Northern critics said that slavery caused the South to lag behind in industrial development. And they also argued that if, if, if you freed the slaves, they would work harder. They're just lazy, the Southerners are lazy, the whole thing is, everybody's lazy. That assumes the incompetence, though, of slaves and ignores the fact that the South was rationally exploiting its comparative economic advantage. And what was that? Vast tracts of fertile land and inland waterways. Why, why get worked up about industrialization when you've got a, a superior economic path before you? For example, during the cotton boom from 1840 to 1860, the South's economy grew 30% more rapidly than the North's. The South, and by the way, the South was industrializing when it needed to do so. It, start, it was getting into textile manufacturing. Um, it would industrialize uh, in a proper way according to its scale when it needed to. It didn't need to. Too much, too much uh, exports to produce. Well, for example, here's a case. The first commercially successful passenger rail line in America was built in Charleston, South Carolina. The first. In 1830. 1830. 
It was 136 miles long, and that was the longest rail line in the world. Only 30 years later, in 1860, the South had more miles of railroad than any country in the world except the North. The South's economy, with slavery, was the fourth largest in the world, and its per capita wealth exceeded that of France and Germany. Italy did not achieve that degree of wealth until the late 1930s. And skilled slaves were sought after in manufacturing. The fourth largest iron producer, uh, manufacturer in America was Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia. At times, half its workers were skilled slaves for hire. The entire operation of the large Oxford Iron Works in Virginia was conducted by hired slaves. They managed uh, basically the whole thing. Thoughtful Southerners, however, could foresee the end of slavery on the horizon. William Gilmore Sims, a planter and a great literary figure of the, of the South and a son of South Carolina, predicted in the 1850s that slavery would be abolished in the border states by the 1870s because they are turning to, quote, manufacturing, end quote. And he said that if they gained, if they gained their independence later on, that wasn't uh, obvious at the time, they, that, that, that their country should have a rule against uh, tariff on imports because the upper, state, the upper South states would want a tariff just like the Yankees did on, on, to protect their manufacturers. So if, in the Confederacy, we need to have a law prohibiting a tariff on imports. And when the Confederacy was formed, what did they do? The Constitution outlaws uh, a tariff on imports. So he's seeing this down the road, you see, 1870. The border states will be free. And he was, it was even earlier than that because by, eight, well, maybe not, but by 1860, slavery was dying out in the slave state of Delaware. Delaware was a slave state. It was dying out. And nearly half the slaves in Maryland were free by 1860, mostly from purchasing or working out their freedom. When John Brown attacked the federal arsenal in 1859 to start a slave uprising, there were, there were 1,251 free blacks and 88 slaves. He didn't do his intelligence very well. <laughs> Sims understood the great changes being wrought by the Industrial Revolution, and we can't over-exaggerate those. The, in, the Industrial Revolution, I say, begins in 1775. Why? Because the Scots built the company of, of, Walt, uh, of um, Walton, uh, Walton and Watts built the first commercially successful steam engine in 1775. By 1825, a year before Jefferson's death, the fixed steam engines of Britain alone delivered the work of 5.4 million men. A year before Jefferson's death. Considerably more than all slaves in the United States. Well, is, the, is this not a revolution? A real revolution. Against this new reality of machine-produced labor, slavery is the personal ownership of labor with its high cradle to grave welfare costs was doomed. Sims knew this, and other thoughtful Southerners did too. I turn now to the third intimation of emancipation. And this is, has to do with the South's jurisprudence and how the judges behaved on slavery. Southern law held that the planter had ownership only in the labor of the slave, not his person, because it asserted the, um, the now this was an awkward principle because it asserted the human equality between slaves and masters. How can you have ownership in the labor but not the person? But they tried to make a distinction in 1856, the Southern Literary Messenger affirmed, quote, the fundamental equality and common humanity of black and white, end quote. So as persons, there was an equality between black and white because they were all humans. <clears throat> 
By the way, in Harvard at this time, Louis Agassiz, the world famous biologist, was teaching that blacks are of a different species um, from whites in the way that chimpanzees are from humans. So he didn't see a common equality between blacks and whites. There was that real biological difference. But Southerners did. They were Orthodox Christians. They tended to believe that mankind came from a, fa a common family of Adam and Eve. Now, as a person, the law afforded slaves certain rights, such as due process rights in a court of law. I'll just mention one case briefly. There's a slave woman, jo Josephine. She uh, had an affair with her ma uh, master, and she poisoned his wife and child. The child died. The wife survived. Went to tr court trial, she was convicted, but there was an error in the law. So they appealed, and notice their, their jur lawyers appealing these things, appealed to a higher court, was given a second trial, there was an error in that too. There was a third appeal to the Mississippi Supreme Court. This is in 1864, when all hell's breaking around, loose around them. And the Supreme Court rules that notwithstanding the, her apparent guilt and notwithstanding she's a slave, she has due process rights and we have to have a third trial. So that shows you how tight they were with the rule of law. Now, with the concept of the person, you can, be, you can deduce due process rights, but you can deduce other things too, depending on circumstances, and the like, and they always change. One rule that, uh, of this sort was the common law of, from the common law of England known as Somerset's Case, 1772, uh, ruled by Lord Mansfield, Supreme uh, Judge. It held that slavery was incompatible with natural law and could be justified only by positive statutes. Consequently, a person who was legally a slave in one jurisdiction immediately became free if he entered another jurisdiction without a statute protecting slavery. Now, this rule was applied in an early episode of the Dred Scott case. Scott claimed that though a slave in Missouri, he became free when he entered the state of Illinois. A circuit court in the slave state of Missouri agreed and gave Scott his freedom, based on Somerset's case. The ruling was overturned, however, by a three-man panel of the Missouri Supreme Court. But Hamilton Gamble, the chief justice of that court, dissented, invoking Somerset's case. Quote, in this state, Missouri, it has been recognized from the beginning that a master who takes his slave to reside in a state or territory where slavery is prohibited thereby emancipates his slave, end quote. And he cited the use of Somerset's case in a number of cases in southern courts and at least a dozen on appeal in the states of Virginia, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Maryland. Another instance is Judge William Gaston of North Carolina. He even deduced citizenship from the personhood of the slave once he was freed, something denied to free blacks in Illinois who were not citizens, in 18, uh, to, denied to them in Illinois in 1860. Speaking for the Supreme Court of North Carolina in the case of State versus Manual, 1838, Gaston said, Quote, according to the laws of this state, slaves manumitted here became free men, and therefore, if born within North Carolina, are citizens of North Carolina, and all free persons born within the state are born citizens of the state. End quote. Now, what these examples show is that Southern jurisprudence, with its devotion to the rule of law, had the ability not only to deduce due process rights from the personhood of the slave, but other rights as well as circumstances and law developed, such as citizenship. 
The fourth intimation, there are five, the fourth intimation, uh, sorry, the fourth intimation of emancip emancipation is the long-standing Southern emancipation tradition itself. Remember that? It, it dominated from 1808 to 1830. but was set back by abolitionist fanaticism. Nevertheless, leading Southern crit critics continued to urge reforms even after the abolitionists, including legalizing slave marriages, teaching slaves to read, and urging more frequent manumissions. Now here's what's especially important, to, is to understand that this reform movement gained new life and became more insistent after the South seceded from the United States and created the Confederacy. Now here are some examples of um, this revitalization of this reform movement. Reverend Benjamin M. Palmer told the South Carolina legislature um, that now free of the United States and fanatical New England agitation over slavery, Southerners could honestly and frankly talk about the need for reforms and eventual emancipation for he denied that, quote, perpetual bondage was God's plan for the African. Remember the Virginians discussed emancipation in a civil way. Now, that was before the, the abolitionists. James Leon, moderator of the Southern Presbyterian General Assembly in 1863, chaired a committee that urged substantial reforms and which declared that now free of self-serving New England fanaticism, quote, there is neither excuse for not proclaiming nor pretense for not hearing the truth about evils known to all and acknowledged by all and regretted by all good men, end quote. Now this is an elite clergyman speaking to um, other elites. Reverend Calvin Wiley, superintendent of public schools, also insisted that now, free from Yankee agitation, there is no longer any, quote, excuse not to take up needed reforms. Our failure to act, he said, is, quote, ridiculous and shameful, end quote. Reverend Joseph R. These clergymen can be a pain. Rever 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 Reverend, Reverend Joseph R. Wilson, another South Carolina Presbyterian, said that slaves and masters were equal before God, and that the latter must, quote, give an account to God at last for the right use of their exalted stewardship over souls of immortal men. That's, uh, placed directly under their control. What? Uh, Reverend Wilson said that. Yeah, okay. I, I can tell you uh, all right, about. yeah. In November of 1862, the Episcopal bishops of the Confederacy, the Episcopal bishops, issued a pastoral letter placing slave marriages, literacy, and other reforms at the top of the church's agenda for action. This elevation of the slave, quote, in the scale of being, was a sacred trust, a labor of love. It was to be the church's greatest work in these Confederate states, end quote. How the epistle, yeah, well, anyway. Reverend W.B. Howe preached a sermon in Charleston, South Carolina in 1864, urging frequent manumission. So this is when the war is getting pretty rough. Legalizing slave marriages and education. The Charleston Daily Courier supported slave marriages. Howe and Reverend James Leon wrote the governors of North Carolina and Mississippi to pass substantial reforms. These reforms, a Texas advocate said, would bring forth the African elevated, redeemed, and prepared for freedom, end quote. Uh, one other example. The Baptist denomination in two regional conventions in Georgia urged reforms in marriage and literacy. Virginia and Alabama Baptists in 1863 urged reforms to teach slaves to read and to allow blacks to preach. Bishop George Foster Pierce of the Methodist Church told the Georgia legislature that slaves were, quote, immortal beings made in the image of God and should be able to read his word. If slavery required illiteracy, he said, quote, let it perish, end quote. Have you had enough? <laughs> these, these preachers preach. Okay, the fifth and final intimation of emancipation is a debate on arming and freeing slaves to resist the Yankee invasion. This is a very interesting episode. 
before the war, and shortly after the first battle, planters from various places, Mississippi, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Arkansas, urged state and Confederate officials to, quote, get the Negro regiments for, received for, for Confederate service. The Confederacy won the first battle at Manassas, but General Richard S. Ewell told Jefferson Davis that the South would need to employ black troops and emancipate them to win the war. Right the first. An Alabama planter and manufacturer wrote the Secretary of State that, quote, the people are clamoring for the slaves to be brought into service for defense of our rights and liberties. In 1863, the Alabama legislature resolved to allow slaves to become soldiers. The call to arms, to, so, sorry, the call to arm slaves as soldiers came from the Deep South as well as the Upper South and from all sections of the public. Some indulge the illusion that slaves would fight and re but still remain under the control of their masters. Mm -hmm. But others understood that arming slaves really meant emancipation. Frederick A. Porche, a professor at the College of Charleston, here in Charleston, um, wrote, appro uh, sorry, who approved the plan, recognized it as, quote, the entering wedge of a quiet plan of emancipation, end quote. Likewise, the editor of the Jackson Mississippian insisted that property in Negro labor should not be, quote, a barrier to our independence. If it is found in the way, if it, if it proves an insurmountable object to the achievement of our liberty and separate nationality, away with it, let it perish, end quote. He concluded that we must, quote, proceed at once to take steps for the emancipation or liberation of the Negroes itself. Let them be declared free, placed in the ranks, and told to, told to fight for their homes and their country." End quote. Editors of other major Southern newspapers, the Richmond Examiner, the Charlotte Democrat, the Lynchman Virginian, the Mobile Advertiser, agreed to arm slaves and give them their freedom. So on March the 13th, 1865, President Davis signed a bill authorizing Congress to raise 300,000 black troops. The War Department issued General Order Number 14 to implement the bill. Part of it says the following, quote, no slave will be accepted unless with his own consent and with the approbation of his master by a written instrument conferring as far as he may the rights of a freedman. All officers are enjoined to a provident, considerate, and humane attention to whatever concerns the health, comfort, instruction, and discipline of these troops, and to a uniform observance of kindness, forbearance, and indulgence in their treatment of them, and especially that they will protect them from injustice and oppression. And it added that harshness and contemptuous or offensive language or conduct to them must be strictly forbidden." End quote. That's a military order. Now, Robert E. Lee provided guidance for this great social revolution. Now, this was a social revolution. And it could, of course, get out of hand and all the rest of it by insisting that blacks be integrated with units from the same state and from the same locality if possible. This would create a new civic bond between whites and blacks, both having had the same experience of defending their regions and homes from invasion. No such concern for social integration occurred in the arrangement, uh, in the, in the arrangement of blacks in the Union Army. And Lee urged that special efforts be made to conciliate the goodwill of black recruits. They must be made, quote, to forget as soon as possible their former condition as slaves. They, they, they should be placed on the same footing of soldiers with their freedom secured, end quote. And when people like Lee said that, they meant it. The Richmond Senator said, black 
Confederate soldiers would wear, quote, a badge of merit and certificate of honor as long as they may live. Their new status would make them, quote, a sort of aristocracy in their own class, end quote. After the war, they will enjoy, quote, popular favor and respect in the Confederacy from which they will reap large advantages. Southerners, they continued, quote, should cheer on the colored soldiers by showing them the favor and giving them the praise and respect so justly due to their conduct. And the Macon, Georgia Telegraph assured that provisions would be made for blacks who served their country, quote, and for their families and fair wages given. The Richmond Senator went out of its way to impress on the public that promises made about the future and legal status of those emancipated must be, quote, redeemed with the most scrupulous fidelity and at all hazards. There must not be, quote, the least appearance, the slightest semblance of bad faith, end quote. And again, when, when these men said these things, they meant them. That was part of the character of these people. It wasn't perfect, but it was part of their character. Why did Congress not act earlier to raise 300 black troops instead of waiting until it was too late? Well, that's a question for another day. I'll just say, is this the first time that a Congress, an obtuse Congress, has not done what was for the public interest? Just look around, anyway. But the important point to remember is this, for the purposes of this talk, that the social revolution and emancipation sprang from the ground up. Even before the war, people were talking about emancipating slaves, and not from the top down. That fact, along with the long established integration of blacks in Southern society, which I mentioned earlier, the evolving change in master-slave relations due to the economic necessity of educating slaves in professions of expertise, the Southern legal tradition, which was exploring rights intimated in the concept of the slave as person, the Southern emancipation tradition itself, going back to Jefferson and Madison, which gained new life and became more insistent once free of the suffocating embrace of a dysfunctional union. And finally, the willingness of a large and diverse section of the public to emancipate slaves as soldiers and receive them and their families as members of their new country. All of these taken together support the thesis that an independent South, um, in the context of the Industrial Revolution and other things, possess the moral and legal resources to abolish slavery in a reasonable amount of time. Have the South been allowed to negotiate a just separation from the United States? From these two talks, to sum up, I conclude, uh, I draw two conclusions. First, the antebellum North disowned any responsibility for a national plan of compensated emancipation and integration. Consequently, it made no practical contribution to uh, putting slavery on the road to extinction. Its policy served only the obsession of freeing itself from the black man's presence. Th there is no exaggeration in saying that the extinction of slavery for the antebellum North meant also the extinction of the black man from America. The extinction thesis also was a background consideration in all Northern talk about slavery and emancipation. And Jefferson Davis found that very offensive when he first got to Washington. Second, historians have yet to confront the hard fact that Lincoln's war merely to prevent secession, that's what it was about, was morally and constitutional, constitutionally reprehensible. It's just time to say that. First, the South had as good a right to negotiate a just separation from the Union in 1860 as Britain did to secede from the European Union in 2016, not to mention the 15 states from the Soviet Union. Second, a war that left a million dead, including civilians and freed slaves, merely to prevent secession under a constitution that did not prohibit it, was morally reprehensible. A million lives just to maintain a territorial monopoly on coercion in the North. Third, and I think this is the most tragic part, the war destroyed the only society in America 
that had developed an actual modus vivendi between the races in which a gradual, humane, and responsible end of slavery uh, could and was gradually being developed. Lincoln ended slavery in the worst possible way. The Emancipation Proclamation was a mere military measure designed to win a war Lincoln was in danger of losing. The tens of thousands of dislocated ex-slaves, well actually hundreds of thousands, around 800,000 it's estimated, uh, dislocated slaves who died from starvation and disease were so much collateral damage needed to win the war. Prior to the war, the North did nothing of a practical sort to advance the cause of national emancipation. And after the war, it scarcely made even a token effort to prepare the freedmen for a new life. The war destroyed what historian Thomas Fleming called the South's, quote, breathtaking wealth, which would have been used in the transition to freedom. Instead, the war turned the region into a, into a desert that did not recover until the mid 20th century, harming blacks and whites alike and called it freedom. One who, one who understood this was Frederick Douglass, who was asked to speak, and this will be the concluding paragraph, uh, at the 21st anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation in Washington, D.C. Having recently toured the South, he confessed that blacks were in many respects worse off than under slavery. And he blamed, put the blame primarily on Washington, Quote, take the, black, take the black man's relation to the national government, and we shall find him a deserted, defrauded, swindled, an outcast man, an outcast man in law free, in fact, a slave. Instead of celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation, Douglas denounced it. Quote, in his speech, he said, I here and now denounce his so-called emancipation as a stupendous fraud, a fraud upon him, a fraud upon the world, end quote. Historians have yet to confront the three moral challenges mentioned above to Lincoln's war to prevent secession. They have yet to take seriously that the best solution to all the problems confronting a dysfunctional union in 1861, including slavery, was a peaceful, negotiated separation. Thank you.